extend my thanks for the organizers to, to have me here in this beautiful place. Um, so my talk is actually going to be a bit more of an extension of yesterday's talks about liquid crystals. So um, it's it has two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about starting from liquid crystals, going to extend it using the language of, of spherical harmonics, which is maybe a little mathematical, but makes it easy for me to seek to transition to an um, application of the theory of liquid crystals to the case of viral capsid in the assembly. And, and based on um, theory of liquid crystals, I will show you how you can extend such a theory to that for the assembly of viruses. So you just heard about the cell, so we're going to go to much smaller length scales, 10, 20 nanometers. Um, the meat of my talk is to tell you that if you apply Landau theory in the standard way, you get into trouble. It leads you to great complications which have to do with the fact that the kind of spherical harmonics you get are large L. I assume that many of you have had classes in quantum mechanics or in electromagnetism where you were introduced to the use of spherical harmonics and if you do that for the atom you, you end up maximally with sort of like L equals 6 or something like that. We're forced, forced to go to large L and Landau theory becomes very complex for large values of L. The L value is the same as you encounter in the theory of quantum mechanics for the angular momentum quantum number. It's the same L. It appears here for very different reasons which have to do with um, the symmetry of the structure. So without further postponement, this is a picture you actually have seen already before. It's, it's on the web and it, uh, I think it comes from the book of uh, Lubensky, from the front page of the book by Lubensky on liquid crystals. And it is, of course, the beautiful pictures of the topological defects or defects you see on the surface of a liquid crystal. Here you see this characteristic pattern with four, which you have seen before. And um, I want to talk about an emetic liquid crystal in a little different language than you have had before. You've heard from the previous speaker yesterday. And that's in the language of spherical harmonics. So I'm going to try to introduce to you slowly. So um, you do that by starting from an experimental quantity, which is the density of molecules oriented along a certain angle. So you take a sample and let's this, let, at, let Z be the optical axis. The pneumatic director here is the optical axis. So take the optical axis along the Z direction. But now you measure the fraction of molecules which are on a certain angle in a polar coordinate system with theta and phi. And you can do that for all possible solid angles. And you get a certain density rho of omega, which depends on the solid angle omega. So all of the things we're going to do now is on the surface of a sphere. And so for a pneumatic liquid crystal, you're interested in what fraction of um, molecules are oriented in a certain direction. Now, because the spherical harmonics form a complete set, you can expand rho of omega, this measured density, in a sum over all spherical harmonics from L equals zero to infinity. L equals zero is the isotropic, it's a constant. And then for a given L, the second quantum number, M, runs from minus L to plus L. In quantum mechanics, you call that the azimuthal quantum number, or the magnetic quantum number. So these are well-defined functions, and I'm going to use them in, the in a way that they are real. And these are the expansion coefficient, and they're going to be the key players of what I'm going to have to tell you. So, um, if yes, please, please interrupt me, and uh, you can start. Yes. For a uniaxial, yes, that's right, exactly. So. We're going to come to that uh, in the next slide. So um, uh, Leo just points out that if you want something which is isotropic, then m is always equal to 0. In general, the order parameter is defined by these coefficients. And 
for a given L, you have 2L plus 1 coefficients because M runs from minus L to plus L. And the lowest L bigger than 0, for which they are non-zero, that determines the order parameter. So these are really the order parameter. In general, this series is infinite, but you're interested mainly in the first one, which is non-zero apart from L equals 0. Sounds a little bit mathematical, but uh, this is the language that will be useful me for me when I go on to viruses. Um, and of course, because this is a complete orthonormal set, you can project out the order parameter from a measured density. So if you measure the density, then with Mathematica, you can figure out the order parameter of this generalized liquid crystal. So as Leo already pointed out, if you have a uniaxial system, then it's purely m equals zero. And in fact, for a uniaxial liquid crystal, uh, this is a Legendre polynomial, 2, 0, y, 2, 0 here, 3 cosine squared theta minus 1 over 2. And you integrate over all angles, and there you have the liquid crystal order parameter. And it undergoes a first order transition at a critical temperature from a zero value to a finite value. And um, you, this language and spherical harmonics, you can extend it actually to non-uniaxial systems. For example, biaxial pneumatics. Whoops, sorry about that. Biaxial pneumatics were proposed in 1970 and discovered in the early 2000s with the, uh, these banana-shaped molecules. But I like to think of them simply as books which are stacked up and they have not just ordering along the main optical axis, but they also are ordered along a perpendicular axis. And in that case, um, you're dealing with L equals 2 and M equals plus or minus 2. M equals 0 doesn't show up. That leads you to two order parameters, one associated with m equals one associated with m equals zero and the other one with plus or minus two. So m equals one isn't here. So you get two order parameters. This is the old one for ordering in this direction. And this one is the second order parameter for ordering in the perpendicular direction. And you can go on like that, right? So you can go to larger L if you like. So it's like a, a, a mathematical game you can play. You can dream up liquid crystals of any L which you like. And, of course, that has happened. Uh, first, you can say, well, why is m equals 1 missing from biaxial pneumatics? Actually, there are liquid crystals with m equals 1. They are the cholesteric and blue phases, which we heard so much about in the discussion yesterday. They correspond to m equals plus or minus 1. I think Hornreich and Strickman were the first to point that out. Um, Theorists didn't stop with it because, of course, this is very tempting to go to the next one. Nelson and Toner proposed in the early 80s L equals 4. Those are liquid crystals with the symmetry of a cube. They exist on the computer. Maybe Jonathan can correct me. I do not believe that they have ever been seen in the real world. Um, L equals 6, Nelson went on, and he proposed it as a model for an icosahedral glass. I again do not know if that ever has been con confirmed. But you can make ever more complex structures by going to larger L. Do you see how beautiful these patterns are? I, f I find them visually ver very appealing. Uh, so they belong to the cholesteric and blue phases, and I'm sure that if ever we discover these type of liquid crystals, they'll have textures which are aesthetically even more appealing. So um, I'm going to shift gear. I didn't know that. So there are. Okay. Yeah. So the the biaxial pneumatic proposed by Freiser was an L equals two. Uh, it didn't. It's I think you looked at chiral. You probably looked at chiral molecules, right? Sorry, it was just. Okay, so I stand corrected. The banana pneumatic is not a representation for L equals 2, it's L equals 3. Good, thank you. So you can see that you can, as, we, as is already clear from this little discussion, you can have a plethora of, there's infinitely many possible liquid crystals, I, so I want to encourage the liquid crystal people to continue on. There is like five set, not room at the bottom, but there's a lot of room at the top here with big L. And in particular, I'm going to go to talk about a 
proposal by Lorman and Rochelle, French and Russian physicists, in the collaboration, who said we should apply this to viruses. And here is an example of a very simple virus. It infects dogs, not you. It's, a it's about as small as you can get. It's, we c we'll ca I'll call it a minimal virus. It's something precise. It means it's composed of 60 proteins. It has a uh, diameter of only 20 nanometers. Here is the observation of Lorman and Rochelle. They noticed that from L equals 15 uh, spherical harmonics, they con construct a density which would startlingly close to this K9 parvo virus. The red here are the maxima you get. I'll tell you in a second. No, I'm going to tell you right now what it is. It's a less than aesthetically appealing expression. It's called an icosahedral spherical harmonic. It was invented by a great mathematician, Felix Klein, in the early part of the 20th century. And it transforms like an icosahedron under the symmetry operations of uh, uh, rotations in three dimensions. You see, by the way, that it's all L equals 15, but the M value is limited. It's minus 15, minus 10, minus 5, plus 5, plus 10, and plus 15. So that's the icosahedral spherical harmonic. And the maxima, indicated here red, correspond neatly to this maxima. And the minima in blue correspond to these minima. The only thing that you don't have is this structure in the center, but you can cook that up by going to higher harmonics. And um, let me tell you a little bit why icosahedra appear here. Um, basically, it's a fact of nature. If you use cryo-EM and you look at a virus, then you find this is um, a an, uh, an virus a little bit bigger than the parvo virus, the CCMV. It has a five-fold symmetry axis, two-fold symmetry axis, three-fold symmetry axis, and there are other ones. So there are six five-fold axes, and I forgot the number for two and three. I think 20 threefold axes. And it's exactly the symmetry operations of the icosahedron that was pointed out by Klug, a great uh, um, molecular biologist, who showed that a vast majority of spherical viruses have icosahedral symmetry. Um, let me give you also a beautiful X ray diffraction. This is cryo EM, electron microscopy. And uh, this is X-ray diffraction. You can make crystals out of these viruses. And what you see here in red is, the, is called the capsid. It's composed of proteins. You see here the symmetry sites. And in green, it's the viral genome. It's about, uh, typically for these small viruses, just a few RNA molecules. And it just contains a little bit of a few genes. The business of this capsid protein, capsid proteins, these 180 ones, is to protect this um, uh, genome, to assemble it during assembly, and to disassemble when you're infecting a new cell. So this is more than simply a shell. It's a very active molecular machine. Uh, not active, but it can do remarkable things. But that's for another talk. So um, viruses have icosahedral symmetry. Um, Landau theory was developed for phase transitions. And I'm talking here about a very small structure. What gives me the right to even appeal to Landau? It seems to have nothing to do with phase transitions. Well, um, these are experiments which were done in UCLA in the group of uh, Nobler and Gelbart on a slightly bigger virus called CCMV. Um, here you see cryo-EM picture of the RNA in solution shown as this branched structure. This is what you actually see. This is the fertile imagination of my experimental colleagues, who I slightly hesitantly follow. I don't see all the yellow lines, but you know who am I? Um, so this is pure viral RNA. It's, uh, it's self-repelling because it's quite charged. If you now add a small, if you add the proteins and you do it at low acidity, low acidity here means that these proteins repel each other, but they can still stick to the RNA. So this doesn't look vastly different, but it is different. It is more compact. So the addition of the capsid proteins to the solution causes some sort of condensation or assembly. Um, you might think these are the proteins, but notice that here without the proteins you see similar black spots. Uh, now what you can do is very slowly increase the acidity, which means increasing the strength of the attractive interaction between the proteins, 
And at high acidity, you get a very different looking structure. It's actually the virus. And this is an infectious virus. You can take it out of the solution, well, not of cryo-EM, but you can take these high acidity assembled structures, RNA plus proteins, and you can infect the cowpea plant. And it produces, in fact, a mottle, a mottle pattern. I don't know what chlorotic stands for, but I suspect it's not very good. So farmers would not be happy. Um, anyway, so this plant virus assembles simply by slow increase of acidity. And here's the interpretation. In this part, you have an RNA molecule, which is kind of condensed by the tail groups of the proteins, but it's still isotropic. It fluctuates. There, there are transition structures, which you can see sometimes. And on the whole, it is an isotropic precursor. It's disordered. This structure is not isotropic. It has icosahedral symmetry, as it should. Um, so you are breaking symmetry if you go from here to here. Can you really use lambda theory for such a small system? Well, you can at least try. You can say you can justify this. This is really uh, the energy, the free energy, which appears in, in Boltzmann. Though it's not really a phase transition. It's a finite system. Yes, but... Higher harmonics? Yes, so there exists, I'll mention, a discrete sequence of spherical harmonics. And this is an expansion, not in the general uh, spherical harmonics, but in the icosahedral spherical harmonics. So you have to do a systematic expansion to get all the microstructure there. Um, unfortunately, there is a big um, experimental fly in the ointment. This is a cryo-EM structure. What you really want to do is go to this transition and follow these different spherical harmonics, but you can't really do that. This is, this is less than the wavelength of light. These are heroic experiments, very difficult to do. So this doesn't really come out of that. This is a separately grown virus under cryo-EM conditions. So people are trying to develop better imaging methods to answer the kind of question, what is the higher harmonic content which grows as it assembles? You mean do a decomposition in terms of spherical harmonics and how does it decay? For this one, the higher harmonics would be quite strong. The hope is that at the transition point, it's dominated by the lowest L, as in any phase transition. That's a pious hope. The transition, as far as we can tell from um, um, fluorescence measurement, is discontinuous. Okay, now back to Lorman and Rochelle. What did they say? They said they they look at a whole catalog of virus. I'm showing you here just three of their work, and I'm not showing you the complete uh, icosahedral spherical harmonic. I've just indicated them in. This is for uh, L equals 15, which you can do with one pair of dots. This is a slightly more complex one, and this is an even more complex one. The slightly more complex one is the cowpea chlorotic mottle virus. That is represented by an L equals 27 icosahedral spherical harmonic. This is the reconstruction by a uh, molecular biologist. The Sintbis virus, you have to go as high as L equals 31. From group theory, you can find a general equation for odd L spherical harmonics icos with, with icosahedral symmetry, and it is 6 times an integer plus 10 times another integer plus 15. So if you take m equals 0 and n equals 0, then you get the l equals 15 for the minimal virus. And that works very well. It's not very clear here on this picture, but you can see here a threefold symmetry site, and over here there's a fivefold symmetry site. This is much clearer. Here you can see the five blue ones. You see the five blue ones the surrounded by five red ones, and then th that one is surrounded by uh, ten green ones. So you can here practically identified. This means, by the way, that there are three different proteins, protein symmetries concerned in the assembly, and you can, you can identify them in the icosahedral spherical harmonic, and the same for the Synbis virus. So the smallest virus is L equals 15. You get M equals 0 and N equals 0. Um, the cowpea chlorotic model virus corresponds to M equals 2, 
So that is 12, and n equals 0. That is 0. You get 12 plus uh, 15 gives you 27. And the Synthvis virus, by the way, none of these are infecting humans because uh, physicists and chemists are not allowed to do experiments on those without a lot of precautions. So this is m equals 1, n equals 1, and you get 31. So from this simple formula, which is proven by group theory, you can get all of these odd L spherical harmonics. Why odd L? Lorman and Rochelle claimed that only the odd L icosahedral spherical harmonics should contribute to viruses. Why? Because capsid proteins are chiral molecules. They lack inversion symmetry. And the even L spherical harmonics ha are inversion symmetric. We'll come to that argument, but for now, let's, let's accept this. So now we have a theory, a Landau type theory for viral assembly. Let's make that a little bit more formal. Let's, let's do it a little bit more serious and write out a simple Landau theory. Well, I'll do that in terms of an expansion of the density, but really the density modulation on top of an isotropic system. So rho omega is not really the density, it is the amplitude of the lowest icosahedral spherical harmonic which happens here. So these are all local invariants of the symmetry group of the high temperature phase, which is just the symmetry group of all rotations in three dimensions. So this is a very standard Landau theory, and the phase transition happens if you reduce T from a positive to a negative value. There's a cubic term here, by the way, that's important. So T, U, and V, they contain all of the complexity of the system, uh, interactions between these proteins, uh, very difficult to compute. So based on the mathematics, we expect that this density should be proportional to the, at least for the K9 parvovirus, or for other minimal viruses, to the lowest odd icosahedral spherical harmonic, so I put here an amplitude here, just a multiplicative factor, and I take this trial density, stick it in here, and uh, because this quantity is odd under inversion, because it's an odd, it's composed of odd icosahedral spherical harmonics, there cannot be any cubic term, because if you integrate this for an odd term, you only have even parts, so quadratic and quartic terms. So now T changes sign, and you get just your... Do I do something wrong? Maybe this? Okay. So everybody who's ever done Lando theory saw this for the first time. Um, it's just a classical lambda theory for a second order phase transition. If T is positive, you get an up parabola. If T is negative, you get here a down parabola. And eventually the quartic term picks up. And you get a continuous phase transition with an order parameter Q, which, or I should call it A or maybe, uh, which grows like the square root of the distance from the critical point. Uh, there are two solutions. This is L equals 15, and this is minus L equals 15. They are different. They are chiral isomers. One rotates to the right, and the other one rotates to the left. So the phase transition is a double phase transition, from an isotropic phase to one with broken rotational symmetry and spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking. That worried me for two reasons. The experimental indication is that this is a first-order transition. Okay. But, oh, you know... Never trust an experiment if there's not a good theory to support it. The second one is more worrisome. This spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking, it's already chiral. These are chiral proteins. It shouldn't choose its chirality at this point. It should already be chiral over here. So you can have some doubts about that. But let's accept this result from Lorman and Rochelle. This is what you get. Um, well, is it the free energy minimum? So what you really should be doing is take this structure, this L equals 15 structure, and take energy minimum. Uh, that's more than I can bite off, or than we could bite off. Um, so we can answer, however, a simpler question. Is the minimum in the uh, uh, space of L equals 15? 
okay, for small viruses. Well, uh, you can do that. You can take a trial density and you take undetermined expansion coefficients, stick it in here, throw away the quadratic cubic term because it's all of them are odd under inversion, and test whether if you take the derivative with respect to the coefficient and you insert the values which were found long ago by Felix Klein for icosahedral spherical harmonic, that should be zero because it should be an extremum, and so it is. It would be very worrisome if it wasn't. So indeed, the um, L equals 15 icosahedral spherical harmonic is an extremum. Then you work a little harder, or rather your postdoc does, and you say, well, let's look at the perturbation around this point. Look at the matrix of second derivative. That's a 31 by 31 matrix. Uh, 2L plus 1 is 31. And what you find is, to your horror, maybe to your joy, because it may mean a paper, uh, seven negative eigenvalues. Um, so this L equals 15 structure of Lorman and Rochelle is not a minimum. It is a saddle point. Okay, so what is the minimum? Um, well, before we discuss that, let's, let's try the other icosahedral spherical harmonics. All of them, all odd of them are saddle points. There are stable ones. In fact, L equals 6, 10, 12, and 18 are the only stable states. And I knew that for L equals 6 because it had been discovered years ago by Steinhardt, Nelson, and Rochetti, and by Yarich, Marco Yarich, who in those years studied very deeply the structure of this type of problems. So I knew that L equals 6 was stable, and so everybody else thought all of the rest are going to be stable. But no. Um, it seems that in Landau theory, an L equals 15 type icosahedral virus is just not possible. Um, it has to be odd, and L equals 15 is unstable. So there is a problem because it stays true what Lorman and Rochelle found. The L equals 15 icosahedral spherical harmonic does a beautiful job of representing not just the canine parvovirus, but actually many, many viruses. They have a large catalog. It cannot be really wrong. It has to be part at least somewhat right. Um, this is the point where you wait for somebody to tell you that you did something wrong. And if you're unlucky, it will be the first step you did in your calculation. Um, so I only know at this point that we did something wrong, but I don't let know where we went wrong. So let's do it in a modest way. We just start. The first thing you can do and is take this L equals 15 state, is which is unstable, and notice that it has a neighbor. Um, I don't. Can you hear me, by the way? Or good? Okay. Notice it has a neighbor. It has an even L neighbor in L equals 16. It's also unstable. And minus times minus is plus. So why don't we try enlarging the free Lando free energy in this subspace? It's 64 dimensions, but that's what postdocs are for. And we have this density for the L equals 15. This is density for L equals 16. And you make the free energy a little bit more general. This is the same uh, cubic and quartic term we had before, simply by adding them. But you give the L equals 15 and 16 different prefactors, different temperatures where they change sign, just to make it a little bit more general. Okay? Um, here's the phase diagram. T here, that's actually the average of the transition temperatures for L equals 15 and 16, goes from plus to minus. Delta is the difference between them that goes to horizontal axis. Here is the uniform phase. And for sufficiently positive delta, you get the L equals 16 phase. No, that should be sufficiently negative delta. No, no, sufficiently po I'm confused. If delta gets negative, then t equals 16. So I may have switched the sign here, I just noticed. At any rate, uh, on this direction, you get pure L equals 16. And in the opposite direction, you get pure L equals 15. Um, so they're not icosahedral. We've already shown that. Sorry? What's the question? It's correct? Thank you. I, I am gratified. So, um, and to your joy and amazement, you find that there's a large intermediate regime with a stable mixed icosahedral state. So L equals 16, that's tetrahedral symmetry, not icosahedral. 
L equals 15, that has a single five-fold axis, not six, and um, it has another two-fold axis, so it's a little bit like uh, uh, D5, but not quite, because this is a strange type of mirror reflection. Um, so it is sort of D5, this is tetrahedral, and in the whole intermediate regime, you get icosahedral structures. Joy, joy. Um, here you have it, and it is perfectly stable. Um, so, uh, should I stop the talk here? No. First of all, um, I don't know if you recognize this man, it's Lev Landau. Lev Landau was a man with authority, and he told you how to do Landau theory. After all, it's his theory. And he said, whatever you have in terms of additional terms, a single irreducible representation of SO3 should be enough. This is such a powerful rule, five minutes, that any div... Ah, please. <laughs> ah, he's the guy who says five minutes. <laughs> okay, so I have still 50 minutes. Go ahead. Yes? Because L equals 14 is not an icosahedral spherical harmonic. And all of the odd icosahedral spherical harmonics are bordered by an even L icosahedral harmonic at L plus 1, not at L minus 1. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, it's unstable. Remember, L equals 15, as it has an extremum, a point in L equals 15, but it's not the free energy minimum. Same here. It has an L equals 16 icosahedral state, which is a settle point. The minimum energy state here is tetrahedral, and it is pure L equals 16. Delta is the difference between... T this one. Ah, uh, oh no, 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 no. This is the threefold axis of the tetrahedral, and this is a twofold axis of a tetrahedral. These? As I said, this is different views of the same virus. Same here. This is a view along the five-fold axis, and this is a view at 90 degrees, which looks like it's a two-fold axis, so it's a little bit like D5. Please answer if you have questions. Good. So a pure irreducible representation doesn't give you the icosahedral viruses, and when we submitted this paper, it looked like I was a Protestant in a Catholic country, and... I was accused of heresy, but it is really the case. The simple Landau theory is not enough. You need to have mixed icos uh, irreducible representation to understand the icosahedral symmetry. Okay, that's nice. Actually, it's even more complex. If you look carefully, there's here a blue line, and that hides yet another tetrahedral phase. So here there's a tetrahedral phase interposing between the uniform, this is by the way all done numerically, between the uniform phase and the icosahedral phase, eventually it goes away. So what you're left with is a, is a, is a mess, you know. I mean, this is a horror for a theorist. I mean, I, I don't like that people doing numerical, hey, look at this, and I have to say, okay, very nice. Um, so, okay, before we try to do a little bit better, uh, I want to tell you that uh, I want to give you a little bit better view of what kind of icosahedral states appear if you vary this delta, this difference between T15 and T16. On this side, it's mostly L equals 16, with 72 maxima, and on this side, it's mostly uh, L equals 15, with 60 maxima. And if you go back to the icosahedral spherical harmonic, which Lorman Rochelle, so you cannot tell the difference. It's just a little bit mixture of L equals 16 is sufficient to stabilize it. It's very similar to L equals 15, so hooray, we can understand why L equals 15 type viruses appear. How about L equals 16? Does this appear? Yes, it does. Um, we should not uh, blind ourselves in insisting that these are verboten or forbidden, um, because we have a mixture of 15 plus 16, so because it's a mixture, it doesn't have either odd or even symmetry, so it's perfectly good. This is a permitted state, and they, s they exist. The, you can use this state to explain a whole bunch of viruses, like the polioma virus, which, if you look carefully, has maxima at groups where you put five proteins. So Landau theory does allow for L equals 15 type assembly transitions if you're willing to violate Landau's rule that you 
restrict yourself just to one irreducible representation of the symmetry group. You have to have multiple ones. And stable L equals 16 type capsids are allowed and they exist. Good. So now I come to the last part of my talk. How many minutes do I have left? Six minutes, good. It's a mess, so we want to understand it. And the way we understand it is by borrowing something from high energy physics, sort of in Leo spirit. And Higgs, so in the early 80s, people in high energy community were very interested in this type of problems. And a theorist, uh, Kim, proposed the following idea. He said, look in an abstract space of all independent invariants. I'll make it a lot clearer. So these are invariants under the symmetry group of the high temperature phase. Um, the set of possible values of these invariants, which are consistent, and I'll be more precise, forms some complex structure. These are the allowed states. You can also in this space of invariance, make planes or surfaces of constant free energy and vary a parameter. This is the physical volume, and as you vary a parameter and you touch one of these points or these edges, that's when the phase transition takes place. This, I'll, this is just a brief sketch, but I'll try to make it more precise. And Kim also said that these edges and cusp are typically points of high symmetry, and I refer you to the paper to uh, uh, give his arguments. So this is simply the philosophy. We uh, cannot apply it in, in full generality, but let me tell you, first of all, we need to go to this space of invariance if we apply this idea. And let's for the moment take a fixed L, and then we have these two L plus one components, and we make a vector space of QL0, QL1, QL minus one, up to QL, Q minus L, I cannot draw anymore. And then a state of the system is a vector in this space, which has a modulus and angle. The modulus is simply the first term which appears in the Landau energy. And the angles, there are two L angles in this vector space. So this is a workshop on geometry. Let's do geometry in this, in this space. This is not the invariant space, of course. Um, if you apply this language, then the Landau free energy, which depends on this vector, is a sum of polynomials in the components of this vector, and the polynomials must be invariant under the symmetry operations of the isotropic state, which is SO3 in our case. So if you apply that language, which I this, this vector space language, then the Landau free energy has a quadratic term, which is independent of the angles. This is our old T. I'm sorry, I switched to R here. The cubic term has an goes like the amplitude cubed times something which depends on the angles, the quartic term has, has an amplitude to the fourth times something else which goes on the angles, and these are the invariants. These structures, which depends on all of these 2L angles, they are invariant under the symmetry operations of SO3, and they're going to be the axis in our Kim plot, Q3 and Q4. So I once again show you to familiarize yourself. It depends on the amplitude, which is what we used to call the amplitude of the order parameter, and there's a whole bunch of angles. So what we're trying to do is how do we understand a um, Landau theory for a large L state? And these Q3 and Q4, they are angle dependent, but under the symmetry operation of SO3, they are invariant. It should, you might think that these are constant, that's not the case. So these invariants, uh, they are, have the form of trigonometric functions, they are independent of the system parameters. All the physics is in the t's, the u's, and the v's. These are mathematical functions. They are purely, uh, in purely universal. So um, how do we deal with that? So that we have here the amplitude and all of these angles. Well, first fix the angles, and then we have something. We know it's a first order phase transition picture. As you go from t, from a positive value to a negative value, you go through a point where you have these two minima, which are the same, and the free energy is zero, and that's how you get a first order phase transition from an isotropic state and a broken symmetry state. I hope you I've convinced you that in general these cubic terms are non-zero, so we are generally dealing with a first order transition. Let's now fix these angles, so we take a certain direction in this 2L plus 1 dimensional space and then see what the amplitude is. Well, 
Um, the first thing you can tell is that the amplitude at this point for a given angle must be such that the free energy is zero. So you just put it in here and set it equals to zero. And the second one is that the derivative is equal to zero. D you've all done this in thermodynamics at one point. You take the derivative with respect to amplitude is zero, and you get another equation. So here is TC. Keep in mind all of these angles. Without these angles, this is, uh, well, it's a second tier uh, physics. Okay. We have two equations in two unknowns. I don't know what TC is, and I don't know what AC is, but I can solve for these two equations, and I get two important results. One is the critical temperature where the transition takes place, and the other one is the amplitude of the force or the transitions, and both depend on these angles. And now we're going to go back to this Kim plot. The phase transition happens at, as, as I rotate now in this space, the phase transition happens at the highest value of TC. As you cool down in the isotropic phase, then the transition to the broken symmetry phase is at the maximum of this quantity. So that is the maximum at Q3 squared over Q4. And at that point, this is the first order transition amplitude. So in order to find the transition temperature, you need to maximize the uh, third variance squared over the fourth variance variant in this 2L plus 1 dimensional space. In the days of Kim, that is a was a big problem, but we have powerful computers and we can do it. So here, we have a simple-minded Kim space with Q3 squared over Q4. And here is, this, here is this, remember this kind of polytopal structure is now a very simple green region, which is the region of all possible values of Q3 and Q4 as you rotate. This is for L equals 6, which is the simplest case for icosahedral symmetry. So you rotate in this vector space and you move around. There's a special line where there's a four-fold symmetry axis, another line where there's a five-fold symmetry axis, and right at the peak, you have icosahedral symmetry. Ha! This is great, because now I'm going to draw you Q4. So Q3 squared over Q4 is fixed. I can vary U squared over V, and here are these lines, just straight lines at fixed angles. And the first time I'm able to touch anywhere in this physical region, as I lower the temperature, uh, so in this region there is no physical solution, there is no set of angles which is consistent, but at this point, as I lower the temperature, I hit a first order phase transition at this point with finite values for Q3 and Q4. So this shows what I already knew, what we knew, that for L equals 6, you get a first order transition from an isotropic phase to an icosahedral state in this plot. Does everybody follow me? So I'll be done quite quickly. So you get broken symmetry state with the highest TC as icosahedral symmetry. Uh, okay, press on. We'll go to L equals 16. L equals 16, you do exactly the same thing. Uh, this whole region is tetrahedral symmetry. This is octahedral symmetry. The icosahedral symmetry point has slid down, and when you now lower the temperature, you get indeed a tetrahedral phase. When so that's not good. The broken symmetry state has tetrahedral symmetry. Uh, okay, now to do a mixture. If you add a little bit of L equals 15, then the icosahedral state creeps up. But still, if you lower the temperature, you reach an, uh, a tetrahedral point. So still, you get a transition to tetrahedral symmetry. This, this golden line is octahedral symmetry. So that's bad news. We have still tetrahedral symmetry. Now let's increase the fraction of uh, 15 in this mixture. And lo and behold, at that point, the icosahedral symmetry point has crept up to the very vertex of the set of allowed state. And now, if I lower the temperature, I get a discontinuous isotropic to icosahedral transition. So this Kim plot visualizes for me how mixing these, I these different irreducible representations allows the icosahedral state to pop up. Here is a more fancy plot. This is the same fraction, now from 0 to 1. This is Q4. This is Q3 squared. The tetrahedral surface has become a volume. The octahedral line has become a closed surface, and the iso icosahedral point has become a line. This is uh, a surface of constant free energy with T unequal to Tc, and you see that if you make F big enough, then you hit the icosahedral point. 
So mixing L equals 15 and L equals 16 strongly stabilizes the icosahedral state. So in summary, uh, assembly of viral capsules cannot be reduced on the basis of a single L Landau theory or single irreducible representation. And the Kim geometrical method shows how you can mix them and stabilize icosahedral symmetry. Want to mention two more points. Um, you can try to integrate out L equals 15. L equals 16 from L equals 15. We see we only need a little bit L equals 16. And you can do that with the method of Feynman diagrams, if you do it perturbatively. And when you do that, you generate new um, invariants, the non-local invariants. There are three local invariants and three non-local invariants. We threw them away so far based on Landau theory. But if you integrate out 16, then you get the other sahedral spherical harmonics. And the surface becomes geometrically Beautiful. So here we have the local invariant, the only one I included. If you integrate out L equals 16, you get another invariant. If you integrate out L equals 6, you get a third invariant. And now this, this you call it an orbit, this Kim orbit has a beautiful structure with right at its peak the icosahedral state. Um, one final comment. Um, there was a beautiful paper in 1978 who thought of this same expression by Shlomo Alexander and John McTague thinking about solidification. And they wrote a very influential paper, Should All Crystals Be BCC? And it turned out that uh, this was based on exactly the same kind of analysis as I do right now, except they simply maximized the cubic term, which is very logical because this negative point is due to the cubic form. So the bigger the cubic term, the more you will get uh, an the earlier you get a phase transition. So they just maximized the cubic term. And they were able to, their predictions work very well for solid helium and for liquid metals. And it was a very influential paper. So how about, can we use the method of Alexander and McTague? Uh, here is L equals four, all even Ls. Here is what you get if you maximize Q3, following Alexander and McTague, here are the symmetries. All of them, all sorts of them you get. Here is the method we propose, maximize Q3 squared over Q4. It gives exactly the same answer as numerical minimization. We can compare Alexander Matejk with what we did, and it does pretty well. Uh, in red, there's agreement between the two methods. In black, you see that there are uh, some violations. So it's not bad. So the old method of Alexander McTague is reasonable, but not perfect. This is the correct rule, we think. You shouldn't maximize Q3, but maximize Q3 squared over Q4. Minimizing Q4 uh, is terrible. All of the black ones are wrong. So I want to finish by uh, showing the guilty parties. This, all of this work was really done by Joe Rutnick, together with a wonderful postdoc, Sanjay Dharmavaram, and Alex Stein, which is a student which Joe and me are sharing. And with that, I hope I didn't run too far over time. Thank you very much.